Moreover, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks and I give appreciation to all the believers who have made to make this event fruitful and successful for the sake of Buddhism and humankind. On this occasion, I would like to touch upon one thing. Buddhism and community is contribution to this conference. For 2,562 years, Buddhism has been widespread throughout the world. Generally speaking, the Kingdom of Cambodia has been widely known to be one of the countries with most ancient civilization in Southeast Asia. For adopting Buddhism in the 3rd century BD, Shin Buddhism has was introduced to Cambodia. The people has taken Buddhism as their attitude and their ways of life up to the present day. The Buddha's teachings. The Khmer people practice is comprised of 84,000 Dharma doors and however can be summarized into three principles. Abstaining from evils, cultivating good deeds, purifying one's mind. Obviously, these three core principles are immensely beneficial to the Khmer society. This recommendation focuses on the truths and the practice, the practitioners to really experience the truths of all phenomena as they really are, and teaching people how to. Better lead their lives into righteousness in the Buddhist way to cultivate self-awareness, to be independent, to be tolerant towards others, and to be flexible under the certain circumstances, etc. These teachings are relevant at all times, thus applicable to all peoples from all walks of life in society. For centuries, Buddhism has played a vital role in constructing and developing the Khmer society into prosperity in several fields from the, from the past until the present. The field which Buddhism has generally contributed to are as follows. Monks, the monks' involvement in society, social activity, the monks went to educate pupils and students in their community, such as to near high school and high school regarding morality in the Buddhist way. The mental training in, in the Vipassana techniques organized by the Council of of the Kingdom of Cambodia. Cambodian Buddhism has established with personal to the Buddhist centers of the Kingdom of Cambodia in order to give mental and spiritual training to the peoples at all ages to make them experience inner tranquility and peace and live their lives of highly moral responsibilities. <coughs> and this training program is composed of three levels, elementary vipassana and side meditation, intermediate vipassana and advanced vipassana and side meditation. Why do we need mind training? Buddhism teaches 
is on how to be IPs, not to be weapons, and how to calculate Brahma Vihara, the four supply states so much, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, to love and to well treat one in another. Inner peace is very important. But the mind is peaceful. An individual is peaceful. When the individual is peaceful, the family is peaceful. When the family is peaceful, the community is peaceful. When the community is peaceful, the world is peaceful. When killing, stealing, violence, jealousy, and hatred are still prevalent, this is impossible, as the Buddhist proverb states. There is other happiness than peace. Talking about peace from Buddhist perspective, we learn that it is the most suitable software we can make use of and put in daily practice in an effective way. There has never ever been a bloodshed in the name of Buddhism in world religious history. As far as basic human rights, all living beings and plants are concerned. <coughs> the subjectorian activities, namely the provisions of materials and foods, to Cambodian records, for the victims from natural disasters and various calamities. With active participation and cooperation of other Buddhist temples across the country. The creations of hospitals by monks, monks also give the contribution create hospital to heal the people as well. The activities of man also in contribution to the widest achievement in temples, including the construction of monastic residence, schools, roads, wells, and funds for both monks and deity. Man also helping out food folks. To live in shortage is in the community. Also provides young monks with educational training in order to develop unity and humanity among monastic community in contribution to the mild social development. Also give the Dhamma talks to lay Buddhist devotees to generate awareness and understanding about basic Buddha's teaching in life, namely refraining from evils and transmitting those needs and to acquire one more. The monk's participation is charity, general awareness on basic human rights, in conjunction with Buddha's teaching. Buddhism and human rights. One of the qualities all peoples need in life, no matter who they are, is rights and freedom. That is the most important thing that they need in life. Sometimes they dare to sacrifice their lives in the cause of rights and freedom, as they believe that the life without freedom is the one without growth, happiness, and distance. We are both equal, not matter who we are. As high rank official, rich people, billionaires, workers, or slaves. The complex of the reality based on cash, personal action, 
of language is contrary to the justice the humanity deserves in terms of natural rights and freedom. When they have all the and now life both rights and freedoms. They tend to live in happiness, causing no turmoil in the society. In other words, they are more likely to use their intelligence and wisdom to do various things for the interest of the society and country. Right now, I'd like to come to the conclusion. Buddhism has been much closely connected to the divine community in deep, as it brings about the development of various domains, namely material and spirit, culture, civilization, literature, tradition, and custom at all times. Finally, I would like to I will have to leave with you all most wonderful sir, wonderful distinguished guests, Buddhist devotees, ladies and gentlemen. The Buddha blessing, longevity, duty, happiness, strength, and wisdom. May all sentient beings be free from sufferings. May all sentient beings live in peace. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, most venerable Fabdichi. So the next speaker is uh, Professor Ramesh Chattopadhyay, uh, the former head and professor of ancient history, cultural and archaeology at the University of Allahabad, India. Professor Chattopadhyay shall read his paper on Buddhism, its humanistic foundations, and expansion to Southeast Asia. Professor
Pre-civilization society of Southeast Asia uh, with different eco zones, diverse kinds of people. Uh, they had uh, mm, uh, trading links and contacts uh, of local products, and uh, uh, they were interconnected somehow. And they followed uh, the principle of uh, ecological complementarity. So that was the basic foundation on which actually later ideologies like Hinduism and Buddhism and other things came. But because it matched very well the prehistoric foundation of interconnectedness and Buddhist doctrine of Pratik Samutva showing same sharing mutualism, so that's why Buddhism succeeded in continuing down to present time. That is the essence of my paper. And if you allow a little more time, I can give some examples. So these are some of the rules of, you know, tradition. And gold, the word gomi. So many gold mines. It is very rich uh, in terms of min minerals and uh, iron technology. And they were all uh, Indians were very much interested. Next, please. Slide. So phys physical and ecological diversity. That's one point. Next, please. And then ethnic and cultural diversity, three et ethnic types, five linguistic types. So it's, it's a very uh, um, complex society uh, of simple people. Next, please, sir. Uh, these are the five uh, um, uh, British uh, stages Star has done. And I will be interested in the prehistoric part. Uh, of course, the Angkor Wat, we all know. I'm not elaborating on those. Everybody knows that. So on those two, uh, next, please. And this is Charles Hyam, a great archaeologist. Uh, the coexistence and mutual interactions before the emergence of civilization, these four types of people existed. Today also, uh, I mean, uh, uh, about 100 years ago, also they all coexisted. Next, please. The origins of Buddhism sought in the shamanic tradition, Kekesara of Prasad. He has written a wonderful book on that. It summarized all that thing. And next, and let's go back to this. Many Western historians inspired by Protestant models try to describe the rise of Buddhism in India as a kind of protest or revolt against Brahmanical Vedic world order dominated by ritualistic complicity. That is clear or no. Protestantism is inadequate a model to understand the audience of Buddhism. This is what I want to uh, establish. Next, please. Um, Buddha was born in Axia, which is a very important phase defined by uh, German philosopher Karl Jaspers. And it's a pivotal age where people, uh, people from different parts of the world, the culture, society, the all addressing deeper existential problems. The Buddha, the Buddha was and Mahavir was. Uh, some of them existing in a particular age. Next. Mm -hmm. That was the situation when uh, actually Buddha was born. His main purpose seems to be how to address the issue of suffering in a new age of growing social political complexity. He could foresee the danger of uh, rise of uh, empires based on violence and all those things. So the Buddha was concerned with the rise of aggressive imperialism rooted in violence, but he recognized it as a new reality. He did not, uh, uh, you know, oppose it. He recognized it as a new reality. Rather than opposing it, he followed the middle path and tried to change the mindset of monarchs, the wealthy merchants, and other influential persons, including uh, the village uh, Madhu Amdapadi. Now, uh, my entry to Buddhism actually is through uh, my mentor, German pro uh, professor Jon Rosen. He talks about intercultural humanism. So maybe I'll not, I'll not elaborate on what humanism is. It's a Western concept. And people say that, for example, uh, there are common points. 
reason is very important there. And there's no God. Uh, man is free to shape his future without intervention of supernatural forces, God. Human potential, dignity, and freedom are the paramount of importance. Uh, Buddhism shares the above approach, but there are some fundamental differences. Buddhism is not anthropocentric as the Western uh, humanism is. It involves the complementarity of reason and compassion, the finest and the most humane form of emotion that brings sensitivity to reasoning. This is a new thing about uh, Buddhism. Maybe it can be uh, said about uh, the Shanti also, love and affection. Uh, Complexion. It highlights connectedness in contradiction to self other dualism of investment, humanism, uh, and all uh, Western uh, discourses with genesis in modernity and the underlying metaphysics. Uh, a target of deconstruction is attacked by Jacques Derrida. In all Western conceptions, we have got self other, self other, and here Buddha is talking about anatta. No self. So when there's no self, there's no pride, no desire, no conflict. So Buddha was a great teacher and was a uh, uh, conflict. Uh, the resolution was his uh, forte. <clears throat> and now, uh, I'm just one thing. When something goes wrong in society, academics or physics, uh, experiments, rocket launching, for example, scientific approach is to return to fundamental principles or laws. Newtonian law, for example. In challenging the aggressive capitalism in the West, Karl Marx drew inspiration from primitive communism, the egalitarian archaic origin societies. And Buddha did the same thing some 2400 years ago. And Buddhist social theory was long lasting, it's still continuing, whereas uh, Marx, Marx's social theory has a limited uh, life. Next, please. Now, anthropologists have actually identified many cordial egalitarian and egalitarian societies. Some of them are in Southeast Asia, some in Africa, some in India. So these are some of the examples. Next, please. Just uh, I'll point out the red ones. What are the characteristic features of uh, simple nomadic uh, foraging society? Continuous movement, uh, collectivism, egalitarianism, no storage or hoarding, sharing, uh, living in present path of least resistance, so no unnecessary interference with uh, nature of people, conflict resolution. Next is generalized reciprocity as for present way to affluence. These are some of the uh, characteristic features of simple people before civilization grew. And there are parallels in Buddhism, I need not elaborate in front of time. And this, again I have pointed out in red, the same features as we find in uh, simple uh, societies, uh, people in traditional modes of subsistence. They're simple people. Next, please. Uh, so, this comparison is conclusive that uh, in an age of growing complexity, Buddha revived uh, the lost virtues of simple archaic people based on militarism and interconnection in his social theory. I shall argue in the end, I can just finish uh, uh, it here that with this foundational ethos of mutualism and open-endedness as suggested anyway, let's come to Pratik Samudbar. This is the central doctrine of Buddhism. There is also doctrine of Anatta. There are many other strong points. The dependence of things on each other. They are having no nature or reality of their own. Uh, then it implies coexistence at relative level. Mutualism and emptiness void at the absolute depth. Um, okay. Next, please. Here are some examples from Majjum Nikai and Sutta Nikai. When they say that, if we all know, I think they not elaborate. Rahul Malpola have quoted from that. Next, please. Again, uh, okay. Now, come to three story background of Southeast Asia. Ethno archaeology is a standard method I have followed. Sorry. Okay. Uh, three minutes. Hmm? Three minutes. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> next, next, I'll just summarize. 
I, I think I'm, I'm trying to make, make my point uh, clear. Uh, now, Juncker, uh, she has been ethnically distinct and social and immediate populations of the high degree of micro environmental diversity. I think she took into consideration mobile hunter gatherers, settled farmers, and traders as a collectors of forest products. Uh, and their foreign trade partners in maritime trading centers. Uh, next, please. Next. And the last one. Now, these are the three points. The objective was to explain not the introduction of Buddhism in the Southeast Asia, but its sustenance and absorption down to present times. This, this was the problem <coughs> they started with. An attempt has been made to explain <coughs> the acceptance and absorption of Buddhism in Southeast Asia with recourse to Buddhist humanism that was consistent with the basic spirit of mutualism that the people of the region developed since prehistoric times. Same values. <coughs> it's also suggested that Southeast Asia engagement with the well-known long-distance trade network since early historical times, often involving the Chinese, Indians, and Romans, was a natural manifestation of a pre-civilizational exchange system based on the principle of sharing, which in turn was consistent with the ethos of Buddhist humanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, The next speaker is uh, Professor Tembiral Subhatar. He shall speak on the uh, Buddhist social work activities in contemporary Mongolian <coughs> society. Uh, Professor uh, Subhatar is lecturer in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, School of Arts and Sciences at the National University of Mongolia. So, okay. First of all, I would like to express my uh, deep gratitude to the organizers of the conference and uh, ICCL uh, to give me a chance to participate this conference, give the my speech this special occasion. My theme of uh, article is with this social work activities in contemporary modern society. Buddhism is spread in Mongolia three times. First, the spread of the Buddhism in the uh, 3rd century BC showed no impact. And second, the spread of the Buddhism Great Mongolian Empire, the Yuan Dynasty, the, as you know, the Kublai Khan's period, Great Tibetan spiritual leader, the Baba Lama, uh, the inspired of the Buddhism uh, among the Mongolian aristocrats. The third the spread of the Buddhism in Mongolia is uh, 16th century. The Tibetan Buddhist uh, spread the Buddhist teaching in Mongolian land. The, I would say the fourth spread of the Buddhism is after 1990. After 1990, and the Buddhism direct deep uh, footprint in Mongolian country. Uh, someone might be uh, wonder about. I'm not this Asia. It's Southeast Asia, but uh, our uh, culture is uh, very similar. The Cambodian uh, culture and Indian culture. We are the spiritual cultural neighbor neighbors. And uh, after 1990, uh, the long the communist regime, the Buddhism revived in our country. In after 1990, we got religious freedom. Uh, most of the uh, Christian uh, the missionaries from our country and spread in their uh, teaching, start the churches. 
if there is some uh, uh, roaming spread among the people, the Christians giving donation, they doing social works. Yeah. Buddhists taking donation, Buddhist monks are all uh, only taking. And that's why uh, the people really check out is Buddhists doing the social works. And two years ago, Japanese uh, Institute of Asian Research Institute of International Social Work from Shukotoko University proposed uh, to implement the project about Buddhist social work activities in Mongolia. The, this year we have uh, published our outcomes of, about the Buddhist social work activities in Mongolia. And uh, in this work, the Buddhist social work activities at uh, lots of Southeast Asian uh, countries, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Thailand, Myanmar, also Japan initiated uh, this project. Also, our country they joined uh, the, this project two years ago. And working definition of the Buddhist social work, the Buddhist social work is human activities to help other people solve elevate life difficulties and problems based on their Buddha nature. Buddhist social work always finds causes to work on in both material and uh, social arena as well as in human or inner arena. Work on both arenas in tandem. Its fundamental principles include compassion, love, kindness, mutual help, and interdependency and self-reliance. A central value is the 5%. The ultimate goal is the achieve well-being of the all session beings and uh, peace. And uh, there are certain kinds of the Buddhist social work. Some of our university faculty members argue the social work is uh, academic discipline. Is Buddhist social work really academic? Uh, would be really academic discipline? Is uh, compatible with Western uh, professional social work? And uh, they are. Uh, they made many arguments. However, we met, uh, implemented this project in Buddhist uh, monasteries in the Lai people in our country. The main uh, principles of the Buddhist uh, uh, social works is the Dharma. We, call, uh, we understand Dharma uh, is the uh, flowing ten uh, meanings like object of knowledge, part of the enlightenment, nirvana, object of the man, Fortune and doing goods for the people, lifespan, teachings, life, etc. And Mongolian Buddhists, uh, from the uh, 12th century BC, they get no, uh, they're familiar with uh, Four Noble Truths, Eight uh, Noble Paths, Karuna, Punya, Good Karma, and Six Ten Reflections of Bodhisattva, and Selfishness, inter uh, 12 Interdependent Origination. In the ancient Buddhist Mongolian texts, uh, now uh, it's Mongolian Tripitaka, we call it uh, the uh, teaching of the Buddha. This uh, letter is we call the human scripture. Uh, this scripture all has the stomach, arm, legs, all these kinds of things. They are, uh, by this scripture, we uh, translated uh, all Buddhist Tripitaka teachings. This is our ancient of the Buddhist teaching. Uh, nowadays we adopted a new script. It's like a Cyrillic script. We are doing also in the basic principles so uh, the study of the basic principles of social works here. Now our the main of the target group is the Buddhist monastery, uh, social work of the uh, Buddhist monasteries in the non-governmental organization of the Buddhist life. Buddhist monastery at the moment in Mongolia, about 138 Buddhist monasteries functioning in our capital in 12 provinces of Mongolia, about 1,000 to 1,400 monks. India now played a crucial role for educating our uh, Buddhist monks. Uh, in South India alone, the, the 600 Buddhist monks uh, the training in uh, studying Buddhist ph philosophy in there. The Buddhist social groups, uh, uh, Buddhist social works conducted by our <coughs> uh, the main target groups like 
sorry, uh, children, your single parents, elderly people, sick people, inmates, homeless, poor, trauma victim, and orphans. Uh, this is a type of the Buddhist social work uh, conducted by the Buddhist monastery monks. This is uh, the Tantra Monastery, uh, the uh, association of the lay people visiting in the hospitals giving the donation. They also the monks uh, always uh, they organize the health day events every summer and they uh, give the free health service to the patients. The men, the events, uh, social work activities also, they're doing uh, uh, donating the handbooks and the textbooks for under, uh, children of the underprivileged families. The Mongolian Buddhism is a distinct future uh, because uh, the, um, when Buddhism is spread in Mongolia, they adopt the nomadic culture, lifestyles. The nomadic people is all the, uh, around here, they are traveling around and they're very dependent on the nature. Nature always gives some practical difficulties for the nomadic people. This year, in July uh, 5th, uh, the big uh, flash flood disaster happened in our western province. Most of the uh, this, uh, residents were the Muslims. But our Buddhist monastery, uh, the monks also donated uh, the food and the shelter for this uh, disaster affected area. Also, in our study, we showed the frequencies uh, of the features of the Buddhist social works. Uh, yeah. the, also, lay Buddhists, especially women, are very active uh, role in the social works. Our research, uh, after Dr. Jabal, also made a study on the social work activities uh, done by uh, lay Buddhist organization. Please close this window. Okay, my presentation is almost getting end. The, we also, the, the functionality activities uh, done by uh, Buddhist organizations. The Buddhist organizations and monasteries are uh, functioning on the stay, uh, the, uh, stay in a city and uh, is very active. But Buddhist uh, monasteries and organizations uh, stay in a rural area and countryside. Is the uh, activities of social workers are dysfunctional. Right? Uh, this is uh, the uh, Buddhist organization uh, during the harsh winter time they do doing social works for Mongolian society. Uh, before I coming in uh, here in Cambodia, we saw the first snow in our country. The 21st of the August, the very cold city. At this time, this time the Mongolians uh, face very harsh winter time. Some of them have lost their, uh, their livestock and Buddhist organizations also are doing great uh, job for this uh, affect the natural disaster affected areas. Okay. Now, I am almost in the conclusion. Uh, I will skip this one. The Dharma activities uh, done by Buddhist uh, uh, monasteries. Should be changed in modern times for the more uh, efficient engaged Dharma activities. Uh, Dharma activities of lay Buddhist organization are, are relatively flexible, promotional, educational. Its members are consist of both lay people and monks. They have more social communication skills, but continuity of social activities will change. Research scholars of sociology cite this type of life with these organizations are more likely to increase in the future. In, uh, in the future, what type of with this organization should cooperate in order to increase efficiency of engaged dharma social activities in Mongolian society? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Subhata.
Now the last, but not the least, uh, speaker is uh, Professor Nani Chanda. He is the director of Buddhism uh, for Development in Cambodia. This paper uh, relates to Buddhist economics and sustainable uh, development. In so may I invite the professor to read got good quality and bad one and we try in the many possible to make what is good. So communism is a bit idealistic but it doesn't respect the individual personality of the person. I think the capitalists they respect the freedom of each one. And our fifth time the Buddhist socialism is just gathering a bit of two and make it suitable for our country. So somehow this is the way that the Cambodian viewer compare. When we say we are doing something, or why we emphasize somehow on the right hand and on the left hand, so that we have a middle one. I think that the king tried to do on what is called social Buddhism, socialist Buddhism. Somehow it recalled me, uh, to tell you I have been a monk for 17 years, so it was not enlightened, never been enlightened, and probably not in this life. But what I'm in very interested of the what I call ABC of Buddhist economy. I know that in small is beautiful that Shoemaker tried to call it later on the Buddhist economy. Yeah. Everyone start with library But then I think that I should start to look when I first start as a first 
day of Buddhist monk, my master asked me to memorize all this kind of faith of ten uh, words. I never understood about that. Just follow him. One is called Eganamakin. Fape Fata Ahara Kitika. Number one is all being fit on food. And I think this one is the beginning of economy, of economic itself. And uh, I have a picture of all fatwa eating in during lunch time. Uh, the venerable fatwa and the layman fatwa. The layman fatwa. So it start with number one is all being subject, subject on food. But then the question is, what is number one doing for? Because number one doing for number two. Number two is body and mind that we eat to somehow sweep our body and our mind. And uh, number two somehow get into the, the three is the, what is number three? Number three is the free feeling. When we eat, somehow we get the feeling of good feeling, bad feeling, neutral feeling. The point, the problem in Buddhist economy is on number four. Number four is four the both rule. But uh, let's see like this, consumption, food, and feeling. This is somehow a uh, basic supply and demand in the economics. I would do it another way, uh, that food, somehow making the body and mind survive, and then later on it produced the free feeling. The same, somehow the Buddha described how many kinds of food, there are four kinds of food, physical uh, context, mental choice, consciousness, and then uh, body mind. Uh, body and mind is Sankha uh, and Nama Rupa, and then become the Vedana, uh, prevent, unprevent, and indifferent. The problem is that how we would doing the controlling, to control the free one, the free, the, 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 the first free. And that's very important in Buddhism, that just not only to eat, to feel, but also to control. And then it comes to Ariyafaja. When we say, what is number four? Number four is Ariyafaja. A way to be good, be good to Ariyafaja. In Ariyafaja, that somehow the something that we try to uh, be talking about uh, unsustainable food, because in economy we say uh, economy, uh, food is care, both aging, illness, and death, craving, individual society, nature, and then in the middle. So I really that somehow controlling the first three of uh, the consumption. Anyway, somehow we know that if we uh, summarize Buddhism into three, we would have uh, feed somatic panya but I also would try to call it Panya Phila Informati according to uh, Atan Vigana. So from how I summarize it into this one toward a sustainable development by using Arisa Kapoor and then becoming Panya Phila Informati we can also control the food, the human body, bodily into Papaya and make a human uh, or feeling, control the human uh, uh, feeling. So this is somehow the summary of, uh, of my paper. From theory to practice, I think that uh, we have a lot of things in Buddhism that talking about happiness uh, of our lay people. And then I think that uh, a lot of people do not know that the Buddha somehow have a happiness of the lay people. They have happiness resulting from economic security, enjoyment of wealth, happiness on account of freedom from death, and happiness on account of living a foreign life. I think the, the number four one, the Buddha really appreciate that. Difficult but not impossible. It may be, I think that uh, the for a thing like that, that Buddhism might not directly contribute to the economic development. But if we a little bit more of study on that, we would see that although it's not really a supply demand in the term of goods and service, but it controls the feeling, it controls the youth, I mean the want and the need of the people, 
for people to make the economic go in well and more sustainable. Somehow, I think that it's time that we, uh, the Buddhist university should somehow study the Buddhist economy in the term of something that I have to do that. Somehow, uh, we have a difficulty in preparing ourselves toward dollarization and consumerism. Uh, 20,000 or more than 100, around 100 something coming to Cambodia during good time. A lot of influence in Cambodia. Somehow we had to do something for next time or next generation. Because for the education is completely growing, the body will make sure we study that type of school line. It might be an option on all the pre to the prevent economic system in Cambodia better sustainability. The destruction of the environment and forest in Cambodia will be beyond imagination. Our country can be developed when the natural resource is depleted. We need to make facts for we can say forty and our next generation is certainly in place. I would say the next generation is our next life. Uh, recall me, I love this word. When the uh, public the Prime Minister Narendra Modi made <coughs> on the occasion of Buddha for Nima of Vipak Puja in May 2015 that without Buddha, the 21st century will not be Asia better. I personally believe that Buddhism will make sure to have a place to shape ASEAN century or better to say the sustainable ASEAN century. <coughs> Should they contact the Machima Patipara, the Ali Fajapu, the Eiffel Park, she the main curricula of Buddhist study and practice must be seriously studied for the purpose of dealing with consumption, behavior, both for individual and society. I think we have to think about Mr. Modi seriously. Your now it's not no longer a cold war, but a warm war. And then with respect to what we just created, the world cut off to replace, or maybe another option for the silver. Chinese maybe not like this, but <laughs> somehow it's really important that the Indian, I used to say Hindu Chen mean Indian and China. This season is the Muslim. We usually got the water from India. To tell you the truth, you have more than 1,000 million. And so we receive tea from India. We receive tea from India. But in November, December, January, we will get coldness from China. We will have a lot of, of, of human wind from China. So Cambodia somehow stay in the middle of two wind, uh, of two seasons. So somehow we have to find out the way that India usually have a soft influence in Cambodia, but China has a strong influence in Cambodia. One is cultural expansion, another one is land expansion. Cambodia, the best one is to find a wise way to live between the two. And that one is the uh, middle part that uh, I think that everyone needs to go on. And I try to say that many times that if you don't learn Ali Yifat Paul, if you don't learn the noble truth, and we do not want to be a Buddhist. The Buddha said that Ariya Satya is like the elephant food. Very big one. Any Dharma, the Sariputta said any Dharma can be put into the Ariya Satya. The same, all the footprint in the world can be included in the footprint of the elephant. We should start to study the noble truth seriously practice it to be in the middle way and that would be the beginning of the Buddhist economy in Cambodia and the region. Thank you very much, Chair Professor Han. Now, all the uh, five papers basically uh, revolved around the uh, relevance and application of uh, Buddhism in the present 21st century. Uh, something what we call socially engaged. So, 
these five speakers basically uh, talk about how it's very important to have egalitarian uh, distribution of resources in the world. Unless we do that, the basic needs are fulfilled. Unless the basic needs of humanity are fulfilled, it will be virtually impossible to have peace and progress in the real sense. So, of course, as you know, unfortunately, in today's world, the uh, resources are actually uh, getting more unequally uh, distributed. Uh, today's world, about 2% of the population owns about 98% of the resources. Uh, Buddhism and the speakers uh, directly or indirectly pointed out uh, sees the world differently from the way it is happening. Uh, so from Buddhist perspective, according to uh, these five speakers, is one issue is egalitarian distribution of resources. Also, uh, two of the speakers talk about sharing. One beautiful thing about Buddhism is Shape. You see uh, a needy person or a needy society, you have something surplus, you can spare it, and uh, so in true Buddhist sense, you would like to share. And then cooperation. A uh, well documented study uh, today shows that instead of competing with each other, if societies learn to cooperate with each other, the world will be a better and a happier place. So uh, two speakers emphasized on the fact that uh, uh, we need uh, uh, modern men and women in the 21st century to learn to cooperate. Then also uh, uh, there was talk about avoidance of wastage. One very serious issue in today's world is wastage. Uh, one of the speakers talked about even Schumacher who talks about uh, um, the, the, the basically, Buddhist economics, how Schumacher says that uh, how we are creating a kind of society which uh, uh, doesn't uh, acquire things because it needs, but it acquires things because it wants them. So somehow human psychology has been manipulated in a manner by the present globalizing profit-oriented world, whereby you want to have more and more. You do not necessarily need that, but you want to have more and more and more. And as a result of that, you have people who have more than what they need, and then you have people who do not have what they need. They have less than what they need. And so therefore, there is uh, this need. Schumacher, in fact, uh, uh, invariably and constantly talks about this that the trend in this world is that we are creating more and more unegalitarian society. Even to the extent that we are building mega factories and mega cities. So having such big factories and such big human conglomerations creates very serious alienation. And then you lose respect not only for others but even for yourself. You get completely alienated from society. Also it has been emphasized in one of the papers that uh, Basic needs that humans have are also the basic needs of animals. So, of course, uh, uh, Buddhism talks about uh, uh, meeting the basic needs of the people, but Buddhism goes beyond that. Buddhism also says that uh, uh, because animals also have basic needs, so fulfilling the basic needs of humans doesn't make uh, human beings human. Humanity goes beyond that, and so therefore, uh, from Buddhist perspective, one of the speakers emphasized what we need is when the society is developing, we also have to build in that society some kind of moral system, value system, whereby humans learn to become human. One speaker very beautifully uh, talks about his paper uh, that Buddhism actually teaches moral values. The first speaker talked about this, where you teach moral values restraint. You really do not do what should not be done. So one very beautiful uh, thing that forms part of Buddha Vachan is a kind of creation of a kind of value system which is human, which is cooperative, which is sharing, which in some ways teaches you to be poor. So uh, for example one speaker hints that uh, 
It is voluntary poverty, voluntary simplicity. That is extremely important for us to do. That is, that you do not take more than what you need. So despite having access to resources, more resources than others, you learn to restrain yourself. You learn to live as a simple person, which is also very important. And so avoidance of boarding, for example, on speaker talked about that, and conflict resolution. So uh, all these speakers have basically uh, emphasized on the, these points one way or the other, as I said. Individually, the first speaker, uh, Professor Hing, uh, talked about the origin of Buddhism in India and how it has come into Cambodian society and how the Cambodians now are trying to rebuild their society after uh, the terrible tragedy that they had under Khmer Rouge and when everything was destroyed completely, how the temples now, Buddhist uh, pagoda, sorry, are trying to build uh, a kind of moral system in the society, compassion, toleration, facilitator. Very nice. So how the pagodas and Buddhism is working as a facilitator in the society towards uh, uh, um, uh, the growth and development of uh, Cambodian society and, uh, and economy. And the second speaker, Professor uh, Choin Gunchia, he uh, talked about again um, how are the social activities of the monks, how vipassana, and how setting up of hospitals, and how making uh, uh, care, medical care available to the general population, and how through their educational activities, and how through the Buddhist moral system, uh, how they uh, are um, uh, the, the, the Buddhist monks and Buddhism, how in the contemporary society they are making their contribution towards liberty, freedom, equality, humanitarian, um, human rights, peace building, creation of uh, uh, infrastructure whereby uh, peace can be built and brought about in the society. Uh, Professor uh, Chakrupath had talked about uh, one very nice thing he talked about is how come Buddhism has become very successful in this part of the world but not in many other parts of the world where Buddhism went uh, and, 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 and got completely destroyed. And he says that there is something very special about this uh, society, its background, uh, because of which uh, uh, Buddhism has been able to gain roots in society. And interestingly, uh, this has been a major uh, topic of discussion in Buddhism, uh, to what extent the Buddha was a kind of Marxist, or to put it the other way around, to what extent Karl Marx sort of learns from uh, Buddha. After all, Karl Marx talks about egalitarian society, how the resources should be made available to the society. Of course, the methods that the Karl Marx suggested were uh, uh, different, but in certain ways, the Buddha also talks about an egalitarian society, somewhat like Karl Marx, and therefore, some scholars have even called the Buddha the first Marxist in the world. So, uh, very beautifully, uh, Professor Chakrapade also tries to bring about that. And Professor uh, Supata talks about uh, the social activities of the Buddhists in Mongolian society, how social work on Buddhist ideals and Buddha vajan has been developed uh, within uh, the Cambodian uh, society. Uh, for example, he says that uh, the fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, basis of Buddhism is uh, well-being of all sentient beings and how on that basis uh, uh, various uh, uh, activities, uh, Buddhist activities uh, uh, directed towards social work in Kodi are making uh, a contribution to uh, their society. And uh, I think I'm taking too much time. Just one minute more. The last speaker, Professor Hang uh, Chand, he uh, talks about again sustainable development, how we can sustain this society, which basically uh, means that how, in what manner, we take from nature to the extent that the need of our future generations is not harmed. We have uh, non-renewable resources which are getting exhausted by the day and someday they will be completely exhausted. And then there are other resources uh, which need to be used carefully and he very beautifully uh, uh, talks about how the middle path, both Marxism versus capitalism, how the middle path from here uh, uh, on Buddhist lines can actually sustain a society. We can build principles and ideals based upon Buddhism in a manner that we can create a sustainable society, where, where Buddhism can be basic to this. Very beautifully he brings out uh, this in his paper. Uh, 
So this is basically to recap for you, and now the house is open for questions. If you would like to question the speakers. Yes. Your question is that Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. My question is to Professor Chattopadhyay. You told that mutualism and interconnectedness is through Buddhistic humanism. I fully differ with you in that sense. Because, you see, we are all people in the world. All people in the world, not only people, human beings, but also the animals, uh, insects, everybody else. According to Buddhism, if we believe in rebirth, we are all interrelated to each other. You may be Muslim, you may be Hindu, or you may be Christian. Whatever the case may be, we are all related in one sense. I do not know how many times I have taken part in this world. In how many ways I have taken part in this world, I do not know. But you told that Buddhist humanism has related this mutualism as well as interconnectedness. I think this terminology should not be used. Humanism is a very small part of the compassion of the great compassion. Therefore, it is the Buddhist karma which has been told in our scriptures. Karma may be good karma, bad karma, terrorism or anything else, whatever the case may be. Karma is always giving us a relation, mutual relations, interconnectedness, everything else. So if you include the Buddhist humanism here in this, I think that will be quite different from the scriptures as narrated in Tripitaka. This is my question to you. So please, uh, I think uh, you will uh, give us answer how you can, you are relating only the small part of humanism to this interconnectedness. Okay, so. And uh, another one, last question to my friend. Not question, but uh, according to Buddhism, uh, it is told that be content with what you have. Shantutti Paramahamdhana. I think you know this thing very clearly. If you are satisfied with what you have, then there will be a peaceful society, peaceful community, peaceful country. And it, I think you should relate your ideas with the Bhutan conception of cross national happiness. Because I attended that conference if you go through the conception of the gross national happiness, then your connectedness with this uh, distribution of wealth, it will be further strengthened, I think. It's not a question to you, it is the addition to your thoughts that if you go through this uh, symbolization of gross national happiness, DNH, then you see something which is very much related to the economic development as is done by Bhutan. Because they are showing something way how this, uh, because our final aim is to be happy, happiness. If you think about the distribution of wealth, it is, it is not possible in this uh, art because of you know the political or all other situations which are not uh, relevant to the concept of Buddhism. But if you go on thinking like this, we must be free from the greed, um, the, um, the delusion, as well as this hatred. And if you can, if you do not cheat each other, then automatically, of course, the idea of this uh, uh, thought that the economic uh, disparity will be over. And if you go through this conception of that will be more additional cross national happiness. My dear good friend Hank, I, I know you from very beginning for a long time. 
I'm very much happy that you have given such a very wonderful idea about this uh, economic uh, thoughts uh, depending on this 844 double strokes as well as dependent origination. Dependent origination is the basic thing which is you have to use in all these cases. So thank you very much. I feel honored. Uh, as it, my paper <coughs> evoked so much of uh, great uh, uh, um, feedback from a learned scholar. And I don't think I was uh, terribly wrong in what I said. And I developed that paper uh, until that's published. <laughs> So, uh, when I was talking about the uh, animals, man, when you talked about Karma, there are so many uh, uh, levels uh, through which Buddhist communism should be approached. I entirely agree with you. And uh, uh, I think it uh, requires more contemplation on that. And uh, I take down your, note down your traditions, and maybe I will improve on that. So, Buddhist, uh, Buddhism. I mentioned in that paper, I think that, that is published, it is far uh, superior to any kind of Buddhism so far developed by mankind. And our um, Hindu monk Swami Vivekanand said, uh, Buddha was the greatest humanist on earth. That is the opinion. So I am these days thinking on those lines. I am not as expert as you, but uh, I will certainly take your suggestion and develop from those points of view. Thank you.
A lot of problems, trouble happened in our Cambodian society as well as in the world. So, um, my question to uh, our guest speaker, so what is your vision and what is your um, important uh, uh, practice uh, that you see, um, that you want to instill, uh, put into place for Cambodian people in a way that helps them to change um, that situation into a peaceful, uh, as um, Dr. Hei Kujana said, without uh, learning the Buddha theory of uh, Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Path, it is not suitable uh, to declare ourselves as a, a Buddhist. So um, I just want to uh, know uh, from uh, some I, most venerable Tengbuns here, what is your vision uh, for the future of uh, Cambodian, uh, Buddhist Cambodian society? And as well from, uh, from uh, Dr. Hei Nichenda and Dr. Saurasi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question, very well. Uh, the vision for heal over Cambodian people that have mental problems that can stay uh, suffering from the mental uh, problems. Uh, I think that uh, we Cambodian people, we, in the past time and the present time, we take, uh, we have taken Buddha, uh, Buddhism into practice. And uh, for a long time. Uh, but, uh, you know, now all Cambodian people realize the way the Buddhist way to the happiness. Uh, can they understand deeply about the the like the eight ways, you know, the eightfold parts? Very clear. They know how to work well, to practice well. For me, you know, I think not yet. So, we have to enhance, you know, to enhance our study, our understanding uh, the Buddhism more and more, more and more. And then take it into practice more and more, just like samatha meditation, temple meditation, and vipassana meditation, inside meditation. All Cambodian people, all Buddhists, Cambodian Buddhists, that we clear that 95% of the population in the country as a whole, practice samatha and vipassana meditation well, I think not yet. This is the, the, the problem that we have to unite together to solve the, this problem. And uh, one more thing, not only this, but uh, even the world is in the progress of uh, material, but Cambodia is, uh, you know, is still in the the developing country, and there are many poor people. So they need to be developed the economic more and more. No. 
materials economic also help to heal our mental problem. Mental problem, not only work, but economic also. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like to uh, inform to all the participants who want to raise a question directly to all the uh, speakers should not should not uh, try to describe because our time is limited. This this refers to the presentation on of uh, this social or from Mongolia. Well, uh, very good presentation, but uh, what was lacking in the presentation was uh, there is a professional social work value base and uh, there is a Buddhist social work value base. Uh, and there are social work values and Buddhist values. There are social work uh, principles and Buddhist principles. Uh, so, a kind of a comparative you know, presentation would have been much more better than only uh, Buddhist social work because this is a well established uh, discipline faculty social work all over the world and I also belong to the same faculty I am a professor in social work so uh, I could stretch uh, it out that uh, you should have social work value based in compared with the uh, Buddhist social work value based and uh, because uh, both these uh, value based and principles and uh, ethics and uh, methodology they very much complement each other and actually the values of social work are also the values of uh, Buddhism uh, in fact the Buddhist value base goes, goes much more beyond that the existing social work value base this is what I think about presentation thank you so much any Thank you for your feedback and comment. Yeah. Is some competitions might in uh, our form of this uh, uh, publication uh, might be uh, you can see this book. Any more uh, questions or comments? Well, then we are nearly at the end of uh, the time. Uh, regarding the venerable question about mental issues, one very famous uh, Swiss uh, psychologist who spent most of his time in the United States of America has uh, done quite a bit of work uh, on the mental issues and stress vis-a-vis -vis teachings of the Buddha, uh, Eric Fromm. He, he has done quite a bit of good work about, about such issues. Just for two minutes. Now, so I would like to. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. A very quick comment, I guess, uh, regarding the unit, the sustainable development. Uh, very good one, but I just want to give a different angle of it. Uh, even the Schumacher's Buddhist economy, for example, is a very oxymoron word, actually, if you understand it, because Buddhism is a destroys destruction of desire. Economy is a desire itself. That's why the professor Hing says that it doesn't really answer the question. But actually, the economy, if we forget the Adam Smith and go to the, to the etymology, economy means that management of household autonomous. And if you take it that, you will get direct uh, teaching from the Buddhism. Also, the sustainable development is a very big idea, the United Nations sort of uh, uh, came out with. But again, this is oxymoron. Because development means change. Sustain means that stopping. So what do you want? Is a change or not change? So but if we look at the word sustain, again from etymological point of view, sustain in uh, Latin word, it means upholding. Upholding from the ground. Basically, even in Cambodian language I ask, Actually, the word sustainable development we translated totally westernized. Nirantara something, isn't it? So it is a nirantara, it means that it is uh, not possible. So the sustained 
actually in Latin, exactly if we translate, it is from dr, dr, root. Uh, in Latin, it's a tner, and a sus is a prefix. Basically, it means that uh, upholding from below, that is a word dhamma chakra. So the United Nations, they just say that the, uh, the, the sustainable development, but Buddha already said that it has to be pavartana, it has to be in action. So there's another one way of looking at this. True sustainable development is uh, through Buddhism. That is it. The turning the, the turning the wheel of Dharma is one way of looking at it. But if we look at it from an etymological point of view, it is a uh, Dharma Chakra Pavatana basically means that it is a sustainable development in action. Beside of holding, and then you have to write the, the three the three sikha, the sila samadhi prajna. So just so to, 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 to improve your paper. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable Shakya. Uh, we are uh, now at the end of the time that has been allotted to us. I would like to thank on behalf of you all the five uh, uh, speakers for the excellent papers. I would also like to thank uh, the co chair Professor uh, Manatunga and Vanteji. Uh, and I would also like to thank you for your cooperation and patience. Thank you very much. So, my honorable Jan, thank you for the report to both local members of Israel, the teams of Rob's Rule, and Dr. Sakraja, the GS Hakins of Rob's Rule, and the GS Wilkman, the Bantuka, and the Indian Pot, and the Include and Nongani, and the Secretary of the Four Board of Pot. May I express a heartfelt thanks again to Professor Katie SRL, Head Department of Buddhist Study, University of Delhi, India, for being the chairman in this afternoon, and Professor Anura Manatunga, Director Center for Heritage Study, University of Kalania, Sri Lanka, and also the five main speaker guests for the clear and enlightening discussions. ดังทรงพลายงอกคนนอกคนดอลสกากาเป็นออกในក្នុងโอกาสนี้ให้ตัวตัวมาคือนั้นสมรักดอกทันทีดังไปนั้นชั้นตัวนั้นหาสมรัก